Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. I am Luan and I will be presenting to you this afternoon. I am from Cape Town, South Africa and it would be really great to see where you are. So please say hi in the chat function, tell us where you are today and while we wait for those messages to come through, I'll tell you a little bit about me. So I have been a teacher for about 13 years and during that time, I have taught students from all over the world, like Germany, the Netherlands, Italy, Saudi Arabia, Libya, Switzerland, France. The beautiful thing about this is, about TEFL uh, in general, is that this aspect comes part and parcel with the job. So I'm also a teacher trainer, a language practitioner, and a Cambridge examiner. So do not forget to post where you are. I see loads of messages coming coming through. We've got Arash from Iran, welcome. I've got Heleni from Cape Town, nice to see you. Cass also from South Africa, welcome. And we've got someone tuning in from Argentina, very nice to see you. Samantha from South Africa, Gauteng. We also have someone joining us from Italy, Durban, South Africa, very nice to see you all here today. Ah, uh, Teresa from the Philippines, welcome. And we also have uh, from Ireland today, India. Wow, amazing. So lovely. Let's see who else is coming through here. Ah, uh, more from South Africa. Very nice. All right, so as you know, we are talking assignments today. But before we do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Please note that questions will be answered at the end of the presentation and only questions related to the topic will be answered in this webinar. Um, but if you've missed or if you've got another topic that you're interested in, please have a look at some past webinars and, and then also keep up to date with what's happening in the future as these are particularly helpful for your time at the TEFL Academy and then also your teaching career beyond. Also note that um, academic questions, very specific questions may be relating to your assignments or some feedback that you may have received uh, will be addressed on the ticket platform. So send us a message if you're unsure of something, but note that today's webinar, we will handle those general questions just to help you get going on the assignments. All right. Let's see if anyone news come in. Yes, we've got some more from South Africa, Cape Town, and then I've also got someone from PE. Welcome, welcome to you all today. All right, so let's get going. Okay, so as mentioned, we're talking assignments. And because you're all doing, you know, you're doing different assignments on the course, I'm going to be talking quite generally about what you need to do to pass these assignments. However, while I'm talking, please, yes, do post your questions in the chat about the assignment that you are working on. And I will, of course, try to help you as best I can. As mentioned, though, these questions will be answered at the end of the process. Let's get cracking. All right, so the first thing that we need to just understand is why we have these assignments. Why do our trainees and our course participants actually have to complete them? Well, it is to maintain our accreditation with the awarding bodies that regulate our course. And of course, to ensure that all certificates and diplomas that are awarded are of a suitable and, and, and a suitable and international standard. It's also to ensure that you, as the course participant or as the trainee teacher, can apply the theories that have been um, taught on the course and therefore learned on the course, just to show that you've actually understood the concepts and the content on our course. All right, so once you have completed the um, completed and passed the unit five test, you will have access to your very first assignment. And something important to note is that you've got to watch that instructional video. 
if you have done this and you've completed all the required steps, you're good to go and you're ready to get started. This may be needed to unlock the assignment instructions and, and templates. We often get questions about, I cannot see the assignment or I don't have access to the assignment. So please make sure that you watch the instructional video as this will very often, as mentioned before, unlock the actual ins assignment instructions. Also, your course may have a handbook, which includes all the information about the assignments and what you need to do. Now, these handbooks are quite detailed. They've got lots and lots of information, guidance, advice on how to approach the assignment, some useful resources, some do's, some don'ts, some don'ts that you need to apply when compiling your assignment. So please go through the handbook if there is one, as they are particularly useful. And also, a bit of advice is to create a folder on your computer where you can save all the documents you need um, to complete your assignments. This will just make it easier for you to sort of isolate the work that just relates to the assignments and keep everything in order. And then, yes, here, save all the documents that you need to complete your assignments and then also any templates that you may use that we have maybe uh, provided on the, on the website that you may want to use. Save everything there, too. All right, so you're not left to your own devices when it comes to these assignments. Yes, of course, it is to show your understanding of all the concepts on the website, but we're there to help you. Lots of these concepts are new. And also remember that our course has been designed for people who have never taught before. So we do understand that you might have questions or concerns. So our academic staff will assist you with any questions that you may have about the assignment. We put you on the right path. We, cl we clarify bits and pieces that might be a little bit uncertain for you. As it, as, as it mentions, though, in the terms and conditions at the beginning of the online course, we cannot, however, preview any assignment files prior to submission. So questions, absolutely. Send us little doubts that you might have, but just a reminder that we cannot actually take parts of your assignment to preview. We need to maintain fairness with all our course participants. And we'll talk a little bit later about the amount or the number of attempts that you have to submit. And this ties in really, really well with why it is so important that we cannot preview assignments. But again, we're there to help answering most of your questions and helping as far as we can. So if you need help understanding the assignment instructions, please send a ticket to Tutor Support where we are waiting to help you. All right. The next important point um, that we need to talk about is referencing. We get quite a lot of questions about referencing. Now, remember, in order for you to compile these assignments, you're maybe finding some resources online, resources in books, resources or information or content on our course itself. So if you use any pictures or base any of your teaching ideas on activities you have found elsewhere, please remember to reference them correctly in the bibliography. You will find a referencing guide in Unit 5 alongside your assignment, uh, which very, very clearly explains how we would like things referenced. Everything from pictures to course content to external content, you'll find everything you need. You'll also see that we use the Harvard system of referencing for all our assignments. And the, the key here is to provide as much information as you can when referencing. Your marker will need to find all your, all your content, the sources that you've used. We need to check links to see that they're not broken, that they're still in existence. So be sure to include as much information as possible. So now let's talk materials. In the assignments, you will be expected to come up with tasks or come up with ideas. And a lot of um, that would maybe involve compiling or creating a worksheet. Some of our course, participant, course participants find the worksheets online. So what is important here is that you do not only send us a link 
to the material, but you actually upload some kind of visual so that your marker can see what you've done without having to click on the link. So upload a screenshot of the, of the actual worksheet or copy and paste the worksheet itself. Also provide a link to the material and then also remember if it is an external source to of course include this in your bibliography. The important thing is that your marker doesn't only see a bunch of links in your materials file, but actually just opening the materials file, they should be able to see the material that you are going to be using in that particular assignment or lesson. Right, so before you submit, there are a few things that you need to do. And I find that the checklist is particularly helpful here. Read the checklist. Make sure that you've included everything on that checklist. You do not need to send us the actual checklist as long as you know that you've ticked off that checklist and everything has been included in your submission. So save a personal copy of your assignments before you convert them to PDF format and submit them for marking. So our system only allows PDF files to be submitted. If you try to submit a file in a different format, it will not work. So make sure that you save your files on your computer and then yes, convert them to PDF before you submit them for marking. This means you have a copy that you can edit if you do need to resubmit your assignments. And then, of course, yes, convert them to PDF format because we occasionally do need our course participants to resubmit. It's not that you failed the assignment, but maybe one of those things on the checklist just needs a little bit more work, needs to be revised. And then you've got a word or a, a workable format on your computer that you can edit before you resubmit. All right, moving on. So. Before you submit, all your documents must be clearly labeled following the correct naming conventions so that your marker can identify them easily. If, for example, you are meant to submit three or four separate files named and numbered very specifically, and we have given you the codes to use, and you send, for example, just one folder, assignment A, this will be sent back to you. It does need to be uploaded and labeled just how we've asked. So as far as you can, please try and do this. You can review or edit any file you have uploaded before you confirm it as your final submission. So this happens very, very often. Our, our students might send through a wrong file because they maybe just haven't done that final check before submission. So speaking of which, we're human, we make mistakes, and sometimes we upload the incorrect file. This happens, and the first thing I want you to remember is not to panic. So if you have uploaded an incorrect file and have saved your assignment to the marking queue, so you've sent it, and then you've realized, oh, heck, I've actually submitted the incorrect file, don't panic. Send us a ticket um, at student support, and we will reverse your submission to draft status. What does this mean? You're able to edit, you're able to add, you're able to change things around, remove files that were incorrect, upload the correct files, and then you can submit. So no panicking. So now you have submitted your assignment and now I'm sure you want to know a little bit about the grading process. So let me tell you a bit about our graders first. Our graders are qualified and experienced EFL teachers. They have not only been trained and experienced as teachers, but also with the course content and the assignment content too. Over and above that, we do follow a marking rubric to ensure transparency and objectivity in the marking process. Do note that assignments are not marked according to marker preference but according to this very particular rubric. So everything is transparent, everything is clear. And then also note that our assignments are regularly moderated by our internal quality assurance department and also those external accreditation bodies I mentioned earlier. So know that when your assignment is marked, 
it's not, you know, if you do have to resubmit, it's not because your tutor particularly doesn't like what you've done or doesn't approve of what you've done. It's just that one of those criteria that we mentioned earlier might not have been met and the assignment therefore needs to be resubmitted. So continuing with the grading process, we aim to mark all assignments within seven working days. We sometimes get messages from students, I submitted my assignment three days ago, where is it? Please note, we've got the seven working days um, to mark your assignment, but during not such busy times, they do get marked a little bit sooner, and sometimes they do take the full seven working days. So this is something important to factor in when you're planning your work. A lot of students want to submit all the assignments at once. This cannot be done. You will submit one assignment and you have to wait until that assignment is returned to you and that you pass that assignment before you can have access to the next one. So please, again, factor this in when you plan your work. To find your feedback, simply click on your profile icon at the top right hand corner and select grades. On the next screen, select your particular course. You scroll down past your test results and the assignment feedback is at the bottom of the page. Please note that you will never be asked to resubmit an assignment without sufficient and specific feedback from your marker. So if you've been asked to resubmit and you can't see any particular feedback, you just haven't found it, we will never ask for assignment to be resubmitted without telling you why, which sections to work on, how the assignment can pass, and also reminding you to resubmit when you are ready. So when it comes to resubmissions, again, it's nothing to feel discouraged about. When I did my TEFL and SALTA courses many, many years ago, I was asked to resubmit assignments. I found it a little discouraging at first, and I thought, why is this happening? And then I realized, you know what? It's to help me improve. It's to help me get things right. It's to help me get prepared for my real lessons when I step out here as a qualified teacher. So when you get asked to resubmit, it's just one of those little things that maybe didn't tick the boxes, the, the bit of criteria that was not met and were there to help you get there. So yes, sometimes you'll be asked to resubmit. You get three submissions in total. One is your initial submission, and then of course you get a further two resubmissions. You are not allowed to resubmit an assignment if you've passed it first time. The two resubmissions only apply if you haven't passed your first attempt. So do not delete your original submission files from the assignment summary box. When you upload your new files, give them a new name by adding the new submission number to the file name as shown in the assignment details on the assignment page. And if you need clarification of one of your marker's comments, please send a ticket to tutor support. Sometimes it's just a matter of getting a bit of clarification, it all makes sense, and you're able to apply the feedback and resubmit. All right, so you will be asked to do a grammar assignment, or there will be grammar included in your assignment. Now, please remember that the model assignment provided with the assignment instructions is only a guide to show you how to complete the templates. Very often we get questions like, I thought the assignment was for this particular target language. However, the, the model assignment is done for an entirely different target language. The models are just there to guide you. They're to show you what kind of information is required in each template. So your assignment is based on an entirely different form to the one you will see in your templates. So to create a new set of files based on the form stated in the instructions. Remember, form relates to structure. Structure, subject plus verb plus object. Think about your class. 
the age, the level of your language grading. Now, when I say language grading, language refers to the vocabulary and grammar that you will present or use in the lesson. And then also think about whether the assignment is asking you to create a face-to-face -face lesson plan or an online lesson plan. So to summarize, remember those templates that we send you with the model assignment is for one entirely different target language to the one you're expected to do. Remember that things like structure, form relates to structure, and also when planning that lesson, think about things like level, age, background, and also remember to grade your language. There is nothing worse than sitting in a language class, learning a new language, and the teacher is using vocabulary and, vocabulary and grammar so much higher than what you know, you're lost. So think about those things. And then lastly, just to summarize, think about whether the lesson plan we're asking you for is face-to-face -face or online. Those will, of course, differ. The kind of resources you use, the kind of tools you use in a face-to-face -face lesson will differ somewhat from an online lesson. All right. So when it comes to the grammar lesson, what we're asking for is a PPP lesson plan. It's, the grammar lesson is based on this PPP structure, and there are five stages that you need to design. The timing for each stage will depend on the type of tasks that you set. So let's talk about those five stages quickly. The first stage of a grammar lesson is the warmer. Now, a warmer is where we create a context for the lesson that we're going to teach or for the target language that we're going to teach. And a tip here is to avoid using the target language that you are about to teach them in that lesson. If you're teaching them the first conditional in the lesson, do not in the warmer use it yourself. Do not expose them to it just yet. Do not write an example on the board in the target language. Why? Your learners have not learned it yet. They do not understand it. So just set the context, show them a few images. Um, get them talking about the topic. So if you've chosen, you know, a day at the beach, show them a few images, ask them where we're going, what do they see? Get them, engage them, pique their interest, but avoid using the target language. That's my biggest tip for your warm-up. Then the next stage we're looking at in the PPP structure is your presentation stage. This is essentially where you're introducing the target language to your learners for the very first time. But avoid just giving an example in the target language. Use that context you set in your warmer and try to draw out an example sentence from your learners. Help them put, put that sentence together. Of course, pushing them, prompting them, asking them little questions, all in graded language, but have them come up with the target language rather than yourself. Also avoid using high level vocabulary at this stage because work with what they know to elicit the target language. And then of course, further examine its function and its form through concept checking and further eliciting. Then we have the next P stage, which is practice. And this kind of practice is particularly known as controlled practice. So here the focus is on accuracy. And for me, I think I'm a little old school here. I like giving them a worksheet, something that really gets them to knuckle down and focus on the accuracy of the form I've just presented in the presentation stage. Examples here are clause matching um, worksheets, gap full worksheets, um, and scrambling tasks where you give them maybe a sentence in the target language, but it's all scrambled up and they've got to put it in the correct sequence. That's all quite helpful here. But when we say controlled, we mean controlled. In other words, you control the outcome. I like giving them something that is quite uniform. They've got to choose the correct answer. That gives us the opportunity to check it together as a class and also gives them something tangible to take home at the end of the day to use in further uh, research or in revision. Then the next P stage is the produce stage or the production stage. And it's also for a very particular kind of practice known as prior practice. And here the focus is on fluency. 
think about it. They've listened and engaged during the warmer and presentation stage. They've worked on accuracy during the controlled practice stage. Now give them the opportunity to speak. I like giving my learners a role play at this stage or a nice simple dialogue, a conversation, using a few images as prompts, give them a topic, tell them to plan something together, to solve a problem together. Here, just facilitate though, walk around, listen to them, don't hover too much, do not error correct at the stage, give them the chance to speak. And then we look at the final stage, coincidentally also starts with a P, but does not form part of the PPP stages, and that's your plenary. Now here, it's quite valuable to check understanding of form and, and function. Um, each stage has a different focus, so the plenary's focus particularly is to consolidate the lesson. I like asking my students to pretend a student has walked in late and missed most of the lesson, help that student out, explain the form, explain the function, have a reflection task. Nothing new should be introduced at this stage, but just something to consolidate the lesson before they leave. So remember that with the grammar lesson, each stage has a different focus. So read the unit based on the grammar lesson and grammar lesson planning before you design your lesson plan. Have some fun here. It's quite nice to design a grammar lesson but also you've got a structure that you can work with so you've got security in that when planning your assignment all right so the next thing we're going to talk about is researching the target form so before writing your lesson plan Spend some time researching the grammar that you're going to be teaching them. This is good practice for when you start teaching and even experienced, well-seasoned teachers do this just to refresh or to learn something new about the target language that they might not have known before. So remember that websites very well, they could have errors. So always cross-check your information. You know, I sometimes try and find resources on various websites and I sometimes see that these websites have mistakes or things that I think might be wrong. Always double check. There are many great EFL websites with free resources that a teacher can use where you can either use the worksheets as they come or adapt them for use in your classroom. If you do use information from websites um, like YouTube videos and so on, please include a reference in the bibliography. Um, but just to tie in with that, remember videos are great to use maybe to set a context in the warmer. If you want to show them, um, if you're teaching them a lesson about the present perfect, where have you been? Um, you know, and you want to show them a video about travel in the warmer, that's fine. But remember that in the presentation stage of your lesson, oh, a video should not really replace your teaching. We want to see you eliciting the target language, you concept checking. So please in your assignments, you cannot find, for example, a video on the past continuous, put that into the presentation stage and leave it at that. Videos will not be allowed, particularly for this assignment. So if you do use, use a video, it's just maybe to set the context of your lesson but not to replace your teaching. All right. Okay, so we move on from grammar to a skills lesson, and particularly we're going to talk reading today. So when it comes to the assignment, you've got to get to know a reading lesson and the various stages. So a reading lesson starts off pretty much like a grammar lesson and that is with a warmer. So again, you've got to think about the timing for each stage and warmers are never long. A warmer, in my opinion, it should not exceed five minutes. I know that there are websites or model lesson plans out there where a warmer is maybe 10 minutes, but think about it, your warmer is just to engage your learners just to set the context. So for me personally, it should not exceed five minutes. So for the warmer in a reading lesson, use a few pictures. 
get your learners to predict what they think is coming in the reading. Show them a few images, put them in pairs and have them talk about what they think they're going to be reading about. The very next stage is your pre-teach vocabulary stage. Now, why do we pre-teach vocabulary in a skills lesson? A lot of people think that's just spoon feeding, but remember, the skill you want them to focus on is reading, not learning new vocabulary. It's the process of reading for information. So during this stage, we pre-teach about 10, sometimes 12, sometimes just six to eight new words selected from the text. We aim for words that are higher than the level of our learners, but not only higher in level, but also words that we know would be particularly useful to, under to understand the text and to complete the tasks that you've designed. So pre-teach vocabulary, and this is where you'll do, be doing all that eliciting and concept checking once again. The very next stage is your first reading task. Now, this is where we want you to include two to three skimming or scanning questions. I will tell you that during the first reading task, your skimming questions are a lot more useful because they test that overall understanding of what your learners are reading. So two to three questions, I would say two skimming and one scanning. Give it all to them at one time, have them read and answer these questions as they read. But remember, this is a quick stage. This is a quick read stage. It's not for intensive reading because that brings us to the next stage, the second reading task. Now here, we're testing for a deeper understanding through intensive reading. And how do we do this? With comprehension questions, but seven to 10 comprehension questions. And this time we really want to, and we really want to test that they understand the the core of what they're reading, the intricacy. Do they understand feeling? Do they understand what is really going on in this text? So here, these questions need to be somewhat more challenging than those in the first reading task. And then finally, we've got a follow on discursive task. Now, for me, again, speaking at the end of a reading lesson is just ideal. Because for the longest time they've been reading, taking in lots and lots of information, will now give them the opportunity to verbally respond to the text with their thoughts, their opinions, their personal experiences. A group discussion works really well. Um, role play once again, um, you know, chatting in pairs or in groups of three, up to you, as long as they've got the opportunity to talk not to further discuss answers to the questions in, in the comprehension test, just to respond to the text, like I said, with things like opinion, um, personal experiences, and so forth. So remember, again, that each stage has a different focus. So read the unit based on reading lesson planning before you design your lesson plan. All right, so in some of the assignments, you will be asked to provide teacher language. What is teacher language? Well, we cannot see you teaching these lessons. We can't, we can't hear that you're grading your language. We can't hear that you're simplifying instructions. So we ask you basically to write a script. We ask you to use direct speech so that we can sort of visualize and listen to the words that you're using when you're speaking to your students. So examples of teacher language that we might ask for in the assignments, eliciting. Uh, instead of giving students the target language, elicit this, ask them questions. Concept checking. We do not, at the end of the process, ask a learner, do you understand? We ask them little trick questions that help us gauge whether or not our learners understand what we've just taught them. And then instruction checking. Now, I will tell you one of the most useless questions you can ask students is, do you know what to do? This is not enough. So ask a student to ask, ask a student, sorry, to tell you what they, what they need to do. Um, ask a few instruction checking questions. For example, after you've given the instruction, ask them, are you working alone or in pairs? They will answer. How much time do you have? 
Um, what are you writing on this side of the paper? What are you going to be writing on that side of the paper? Where will you find your definitions? So ask them a few questions and the answers they give will tell you whether or not they've understood the instruction. Kills two birds with one stone though. What it also does is that very often other students who didn't quite get step three of the instruction, well, there you go. It gets rehashed through these in instruction checking questions and they know what to do. So that's another example of, student, of teacher language that we will ask you to um, provide in the assignments. So let's look a little bit further at eliciting, because I'm sure you've seen that this comes up quite regularly in our course. Eliciting is where the teacher asks questions to draw information from the students. And this is going to help them remember what they've learned so much more than just giving them the information. If you are teaching them the past continuous, show them a picture, ask them what is, what is happening here? How do we change that into the past? And there you've got your sentence. Eliciting helps a lot. It helps you, it makes your learners part of the process. It shows you what they know and makes the content of what, you, of what you're teaching a lot more likely to be remembered. And then another example that we mentioned earlier that we're just going to get into a little bit more is concept checking. Now, concept checking comes at the end of you've elicited something, you've maybe taught its pronunciation, and now you're concept checking. So, for example, here, you've taught them the word excited. Now you want to check. Do you get excited to go to a party? If they say yes, okay, step one. How about going to the dentist? No. Uh, is excited a good feeling or a great feeling? If they make that distinction, they're on the right track. So these are examples of concept checking questions and they replace that all useless question of do you understand? They replace that question, with these little trick questions based on your learner's answers, you will know whether or not they've understood the meaning of the word. And remember to keep concept questions closely related to the meaning of the word. All right. So again, as mentioned earlier, instruction checking, we avoid asking the question, do you understand or do you know what to do? Ask students to repeat the instructions to you or ask instruction checking questions. How much time do you have? Are you working alone or in pairs? Um, where do you find this? What are you writing on this side? Um, demonstrate things when giving instructions. Do not just ask them, do you understand? Because a lot of students will say yes, and they do that for a couple of reasons. One, because they feel they've understood. Or two, they just don't want to be that one person saying no when everyone else is saying yes. This is the best way to check that they're really on track with what you are teaching and what you want them to do. All right, so moving on to authentic text. Now, some of the assignments will ask you to source an authentic text. Um, now, remember that, well, authentic material. And, you know, an authentic text or an authentic piece of material is a text We'll talk about it in terms of text for now, but a text that has not been edited for use in an EFL classroom. In other words, it's not been created for a language class. Um, examples like BBC um, or National Geographic or Discovery, you know, various texts like that, newspaper clippings, um, an article out of a magazine. These are authentic texts. Um, and their sources are the type of things that a first language speaker would pick up and would be able to read. However, if you find something on example, the British Council, it would not be authentic because these texts have been specifically graded for learners of various levels and they are not authentic and therefore not suitable for the assignment. So when selecting authentic texts, consider the following. The nationality and culture, the background in your class, um, the age of your class, the language level, very important, of your class, the gender, gender situation in your class. Your text must be appropriate for all students in the classroom. And very often, I tend to avoid certain topics in the classroom. These relate to politics, religion, sex, 
Those are topics I steer away from. Your learners, if they're adults, can go and sit in a coffee shop at the end of the lesson and freely chat about those topics. However, keep the classroom neutral because the core aim is to learn English. All right. So let's have a little quiz. I'd like you to decide what you think would be the ideal authentic text for a B1 class, 10 people, um, let's say an adult class, uh, mixed nationality students, and the vocabulary lesson topic is pollution caused by plastic. What do you think is the best authentic text for this class? Put your answers in the chat. So we've got A, a cartoon showing a person littering on a beach. We've got B, a statistical report from environmental journal and we've got c a newspaper article on pollution from the daily tribune so put your answers in the chat tell me what do you think is the best authentic um, text for a group of adults b1 level mixed nationality lower intermediate any suggestions Okay, I see a lot of C's coming through. Yeah, yeah, lots of C's. And I will tell you that yes, you are correct. C is ideal. A cartoon showing a person littering on a beach might not contain enough cohesive language. Um, a statistical report from environmental journal might just be too technical and also might not contain enough cohesive language for that particular level. But a newspaper article, yes, that might be the way to go here. All right, so a few general hints before we move on. So, Right, just a little bit of a glitch there. All right, so when it comes to difficult vocabulary, use the TEFL uh, glossary and a dictionary. Check that you have downloaded all the documents before starting on these assignments and do read over the checklist and assessment criteria as these will guide you to all the important information required for these assignments. All right, and last but not least, proofread your work. So if English is not your first language, please check your language carefully. Even if English is your first language, check your work carefully. Your marker will be looking for evidence that your English is of a higher level than the students the lesson has been designed for. So even if you are a native speaker, as mentioned earlier, it is still important to carefully proofread your work and check for those little mistakes. Use the grammar and spell check function in your word processing program. And again, if something is unclear, get some help. Because like I said, yes, the assignment is checked for concept and understanding of these concepts. But because it is an English teaching course, you will also be marked for accuracy. So do make sure that your work is of a high standard when it comes to grammar and vocabulary use. All right, so where to get help? As I mentioned earlier, yes, while the assignments are there to check that you understand the key concepts in the course, help is also at hand. So admin support are there for issues like extensions, login issues, I can't find my course content. We get all kinds of questions, but admin support would be able to help you with anything admin related. And also, like I mentioned earlier, if you do want to extend your course for whatever reason. If you've got any IT problems, contact our IT support department. All these um, contact details are on your course um, interface. You'll be able to find everything relatively easily. And yes, these include your computer related problems with Moodle. So please contact IT support if you've got any issues there. And then tutor support is for those academic and assignment related questions. 
something is unclear in the course material, something is unclear in the assignment instructions, your tutor has sent you feedback and you're not fully aware of what's going on, or you can't find your feedback for some reason, please send us a, a ticket to tutor support and we're more than happy to help. All right, so we have come to the Q&A. I hope the information that I've given you is helpful. Um, and right now, you've got the opportunity to ask questions. All right. So, any questions? I am going to scroll through. Let's see. All right. I've got a comment here. Even after teaching, let me just... Um, Even after teaching vocabulary, if the student is able to read fine, but not understand the reading passage, what should be done? All right, so this is why the words you select from your passage is, are so important. They need to be words that, yeah, think about those, those words that you select for pre-teaching, think about those words as stumbling blocks. If, for example, your student reads the text and those stumbling blocks pop up, those are the words that you would definitely have to teach. Also, Renika, please remember that this is why choosing the correct reading, a, a level appropriate reading is so important. If you have chosen something that is too high for the level of class, then the reading is actually the problem and not maybe the selection of words you've chosen to pre-teach. So firstly, the level of the reading should be appropriate. And secondly, read it, use a vocabulary profiler, select words that are of a higher level and words that you know are core for the understanding of that text. I don't think that helps. All right, any further questions? So now's your chance. You can ask about the assignments, anything you feel I have not covered, you're more than welcome to ask. But Renika, I hope that's helped you. Ah, how long? Let me show this up here. We've got another question. Um, I think it's Jean or Jean, I'm not sure. How long should your assignment take you to do? So this is a good question, but it's a difficult one to answer because remember the course is self-study. So when it comes to assignments, I would say minimum 10 hours. Um, some students take a little bit longer, others are a bit quicker, but I would say at least 10 hours of work, solid work has got to be put into an assignment. So I would suggest no less than 10 hours, but take your time with this. That is why I said earlier, factor marking time and the, the possibility of resubmitting into your planning so, so that you've got plenty of time to submit um, your work and receive access to the next assignment. All right, another good question. Um, Rosie, do the assignments come through every week or do we get them all at once? Thank you for your question, Rosie. Very, very valid question. The assignments get unlocked one at a time, Rosie. So at the end of unit five, you will have access after doing the after unit test, you will have access to that first assignment. You then do the assignment, you submit it. Either you've passed first time or you have to resubmit, but only once you've passed that first assignment and then moved along will you have access to submit the next one. So assignments get released at the end of unit five, at the end of unit seven and at the end of unit 10. Um, but like I said, you will not be able to submit the next one until the previous one has been um, passed. So Rosie, I hope that answers your question. All right, so I think it's Renuka. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Where can I find the graded text passages? Right, so when it comes to, this is quite a broad question because if you're working at a language school, they will most likely give you a course book. In this course book, you will find ready-made readings 
and these will be ready for the level of class you're teaching. So that takes a lot of that hard work of searching for something out of the equation. However, if you're working on an assignment like ours where you've got to find your own, then and, and it's a an authentic material that you're looking for, then Renuka, I would be looking in magazines, online news sites, National Geographic, for example, BBC, um, in South Africa, for example, we have a few very valid, great news sites, but they've also got travel sections and food sections. So these are all authentic materials. And I would say you're going to have to just look at the kind of vocabulary in them, toss it into a vocabulary profiler to see what you're working with. That is if, of course, you are looking for an authentic piece all on your own. But like I said, if you're working at a school, they're most likely going to give you some kind of course book where they are already reading passages for your students. All right, Renuka, I hope that's helped. Okay, and then we've got a question from Cass. How detailed would you recommend the lesson plan in the assignment be? So Cass, remember you've got a couple of assignments where bits of lesson plans have to be handed in. Now remember that you are, we're not able to watch you teaching the lesson. Um, but also, of course, you don't want to make it too intricate and too involved. So I would say as long as your marker is able to understand what is happening at that stage, what the aim of that stage is, what the interaction is, who is interacting with whom, for example, um, what the teacher is doing at that stage, what the student is doing, it needs to just be that clear. We need to be able to understand what is happening at the various stages in your lesson plan. Please, something that I do want to tell you, Cass, is do not put teacher dialogue into your lesson plans. A lot of our course participants put their entire dialogue, like, good morning class, today we are going to, none of that. Keep it simple with just brief, concise explanations of what you will be doing at the various stages. You can, of course, include a couple of examples of what you would say, but your lesson plan is not really the document for your lengthy dialogue. That's what your teacher language document is for. As long as the lesson plan is clear enough for us to understand um, what you're planning for each stage, you're good to go. Also, in some, of the, in some of the assignments, Cass, I do believe there are word limit recommendations. So see if you can follow these. We have a 10% leeway, and this might be quite helpful for you. But thank you for your question. Really, really valid. Um, Carlos, are we going to have access to these slides? Absolutely, you will, but you will be able to have access to this webinar as a whole. Um, so I think that's what you're referring to. You can absolutely find these. If you can't find them, send us a ticket and we'll send you the link, but you'll be able to find these no problem. Check on our site also for past webinars uh, for any of these important topics that you might have missed. All right, and then do uh, check in regularly to see what the upcoming topics are. But, but for this one particularly, Cass, absolutely it is available to you. All right. Um, and then, yes, a very another, uh, another very good question. Tiasha, will the next unit six and seven open up while we wait for the assignment? Absolutely, you can continue your online study. You do not have to wait for the units to be open while you wait for an assignment. We would never want to delay the process so much. We want you to keep studying. Um, and just because we're taking a couple of days to mark your assignment doesn't mean that you should have to wait. So absolutely, you can continue while we mark your assignment. I hope that helps. Thank you for your question. Arash, I submitted my first assignment two days ago. Well done. The instructions were very clear. No problem so far. Thank you for giving the opportunity to use your method. Absolutely. We're here to help you. Any of these methods that you find might be useful for your upcoming assignment or one of the other assignments. Absolutely. That's why we have these webinars so that you can use these ideas. And all the best with your grade. I've got another question here. How many sessions of webinars are remained? Well, we're going to keep them going for as long as we can, Nafisa. So tune in on a weekly basis. Um, we've got a, quite a few lined up. We will not be leaving you anytime soon. We'll keep them going as long as you want them.
All right, I'm just scrolling through to make sure that I've answered all the questions that we've got so far. Um, let's see. All right, are there any other questions before we wrap up? And you're very welcome. So all of you that have asked questions and thanked me in the interim, you're absolutely welcome. All right. All right, so if there are no more questions, even those of you who have asked questions, you're very welcome to keep asking. And remember that if you think of a question a little later on that you forgot to ask, it's not a problem at all. Just remember to find us a tutor support where you can ask all the questions that you need. Just remember that we will not be previewing any of your assignments or any parts of your assignments, but we can certainly answer as many questions um, as you need to get you going on the right path and to actually have you enjoy the assignment process. And you're welcome, you're very welcome, Carlos. The support and encouragement is there for you to help you get through the, the course and also these assignments. You're absolutely welcome. All right, so if there aren't any other questions, I'd like to thank you very, very much for being with me today. It's been good, it's been fun. And um, the last thing that I'm, I am going to ask you to do is to um, fill in our survey and tell us what you thought of this webinar. We'd really like to hear from you. We'd like to hear your input on what you liked, what you'd like to see more of. So please fill in the survey when you have a moment. It's on your screen, but it's also in the chat. So feel free when you have a second to fill that in. I'd like to thank you for participating today. Thank you for being here today. I hope it was useful. I hope it was helpful. All the best with the course and particularly those, uh, those assignments. Have a good weekend. Bye.